Right, so this is calving before I've trimmed the foot. Which seems to work okay. Um, the clay is leather hard, so it's a nice um, dryness to carve. You can let it get a bit drier, um, especially before neatening up, actually. It can be worth doing the two stages of this at different points, just because you kind of, you want to get crisp edges, you want it to be um, on the drier side. But there are some advantages to not waiting until like, it will bend rather than snapping if you go on the wetter side. So depending on how careful you're going to be um, and your clay body, you have to figure out where the right balance is. Um, I'm using one of the tube hole cutters rather than a drill bit for this. I use the drill bit when using my hole cutting guides because that marks the centre and a drill bit cuts from the centre so it's very easy to locate. These aren't so good with the hole cutting guides because you can't easily mark the exact centre and cut around it but for this it's a very easy way of just cutting a circle. So, um, got it on an old t-shirt. I wouldn't normally do it on the wheel but it's just an easy place to record so I'm going to keep going here. Um, go probably just below halfway up from the base when doing it this way, I'll post a video. There's a, another way of making it that's a bit simpler than this, um, where you can go a bit lower. But make my starting hole, and then you can draw on um, greenware with a sharpie, and it will burn off completely in the bisque. So, what I want to do is come out that hole about halfway up and then loop round underneath trying to stay a similar distance away from the hole and then up and then the other line comes off around the top you don't want to leave too narrow close that bit down that's wider than it needs to be but you don't want this to be too narrow because any drip coming off that will close it if um, they're just a few millimetres apart. So it's worth erring on the side of uh, too wide rather than too narrow. And then I'm using a scalpel for this. It's not the sharpest in the world anymore just because I've cut clay with it too many times it's hard to do this well with it facing the camera but hopefully I can do an alright job so the real trick is don't cut all the way out of the rim so what I'm doing is I'm going to cut cross like that and you can actually leave this piece in there if you want while it dries but um, it does make cleaning up a bit trickier so I am going to remove it but by leaving the rim intact it retains pretty much all the, the strength that it normally would even though you've carved a lump out of it if you were to cut completely out it would be free to just collapse if it wanted. Now it wouldn't at this level of dryness, but it would take on far more strain as it dried. So the, the clay would want to warp. Um, and the thing with clay is that it would remember that. And in the firing, it would be far more likely to warp. So trying to get this out without knocking the bit that you've left. You can carve that shape, yeah, so as I was saying, leave a bridge there. And then, yeah, that's not the neatest I've ever done. It's easier when you're not doing it towards the camera, so when you do it, do what you saw rather than what I did. You see what I mean? Um, have it face towards you. And then what I do is I use 
the scalpel to mitre the edge. And this is where the, the trick to getting it really neat comes in because you can mitre up to the rim. And so that now when you cut it off, that edge is already neat. You see what I mean? Um, basically, what you're going to remove the clay from the middle with, I use a hacksaw blade because you can very gently saw away at it and then bone dry clay will will go with the with the saw without too much fight but yeah if you um, you angle the edge like that and then just keep that going up to the rim then when you cut it off you will actually get a near perfect um, edge to the whole thing and you can sponge it to just finish it off but it means you've got all the strength of a complete rim while still not having much clay to remove when it's bone dry to to open that out so anyway with um yarn bowls as i understand it i'm obviously no expert but um i believe you need one hole or you can have some people do it where there's, there's kind of multiple like it comes down and splits you've got multiple yarns if you want them but one hole has to go out of the top because the whole point is you don't want to you want to be able to remove the ball without it going through a hole so the holes have to be able to um, reach the top and you can put the yarn in and out without feeding it through anything but they will also have two holes generally next to it or one or two holes or something like that um, and as i understand it that's for the needles to go in but i'm not entirely sure about that it seems to be the way that they're all done. Someone told me it's for the needles to go through, which sort of makes sense for, because obviously you wouldn't put the thread through it for exactly the same reason that this one's open, because you then can't remove it without rolling the whole ball through. So, um, yeah. So what I would then do is just add Two more holes, and then I use uh, a mitering, no, countersinking, sorry, bit. Um, these holes are right on the limit of what it can do, and the clay's a bit wet, so it's not going to do the best job ever. But if you let it firm up a bit first, then it doesn't, it, it cuts the clay rather than just pushing it out to the side. But um, it's a good way of beveling the um, the outside of a hole. Uh, and I'm going to neaten the rest of that up, sponge in that bit slightly, then leave it for half an hour or so and trim the foot. This is another way of doing it, um, much easier to cut. Uh, the downside to this is that if you're using interesting glazes, that will flow and pull, you've got less surface for them to do that. Uh, the upside is it doesn't weaken that part as much. So depending on your clay and how hot you're firing and how long the firing and whether or not it will warp, this might be a better bet. Um, uh, so it's just literally hole made with the cutter and then just cut round. Again, I'm leaving a bridge in, I'll neaten that up in a second. Um, but that's going to be what gives it the strength as it dries. Right, this is the next day. Um, this is not quite bone dry, but pretty dry. And I've got an old hacksaw, and it's actually um, like a jigsaw blade, but you want something with a fine tooth. Um, and if I'm going to do more of these, I'm going to get a better one because this one's a bit wobbly, but it's just one that was kicking around in the garage. Um, something with a fine tooth so you can just very gently ease through the clay. And it'll crack along the lines that you scored in. You can 
still use a scalpel to clean them up roughly and then sponge to finish the job off. As for what sponge I use, I throw with um, Zeme porcelain sponges and I go through one every month or two and you can see the difference. This is a red, this is sort of a couple of weeks old I think, so it's starting to wear out, but how much thinner they get as you just ruin them basically. Um, I throw quite a lot, well I suppose not compared to production pods, but yeah, I get through them. But the nice thing is as they wear out and get thinner and more kind of falling apart, um, they become more flexible. They've got quite a fine structure to them because they're the porcelain version. They do some coarser ones for um, stoneware and things, but you know, I use this for stoneware, it's just a nice sponge. But as it becomes thinner and more flexible, it is ideal for getting round awkward shapes so I just use it to so you can see you can bend it around the clay and just round that off um, once you've got it rounded but it's still a bit wet you can use one of the um, silicon shaping tools to burnish it back to smooth because the grog will be exposed. This has quite a fine grog so it's just slightly rougher, not too bad. If you've got a really coarse stoneware you'll really feel the grog as you sponge back it gets more and more sandpapery. With this it just gets a light texture. Not the end of the world but given that the idea is that um, yarn's going to pull through this you want this to be as smooth as possible and these tools are quite useful for that. So just as you sponge just burnish it back to smooth and then that will be your finished yarn bowl and once you've sponged it and smoothed it's basically not a lot more you need to do. Um, in terms of firing I don't think it re there's, I don't think there's a huge amount you can do at that point because it shouldn't warp in the bisque firing and in the glaze firing you can't support it without it sticking. So I think so long as you've managed to avoid stress up until the bisque firing you're going to be as okay as you could possibly be in the glaze firing and that will come down to how thin you've carved it and how strong your clay is and how hot you fire. If you're going to cone 10 with a really long hot firing um, and your clay can only just take it, you might get it, you might be warping. I don't, I don't really know. In cone 6 firings with this clay, it, it generally seems to be okay. Um, but yeah, just as with all things clay, the trick is to try and avoid stress that's going to come out later. Um, and by leaving that bridge in, you keep it as strong as possible until the point at which it, it can't move anywhere now and it's basically basically solid so it's not going to feel much strain. I guess the thing to, to do is in the firing probably fire, bisque fire it upright and don't stack them. You know, you could stack something inside if you want to save space, so like that, but don't put another bowl on top because you'll be forcing it out. Um, but, but really just be a bit more careful with this than you would another bowl and it probably will be alright.